Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a composer whose name you may not recognize, but I can assure you that his music is indelibly planted into the soundtrack of our lives. If you've watched network television over the past 40 years, his music will be very familiar to you. He wrote the theme songs for hit TV shows like Home Improvement, Roseanne, and The Secret Life of the American Teenager. And his music has been featured on dozens of TV shows like Laverne and Shirley, Happy Days, New Heart, Beverly Hills 90210, Mork and Mindy, Cheers, Seventh Heaven, and so many others. He's serving his fifth term on the board of directors of the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, known as ASCAP. And he's the past president of the Society of Composers and Lyricists. He's had three Emmy nominations and has won 38 ASCAP film and television awards, including 16 in the most performed theme category. I'm honored and delighted to welcome Dan Foliart to our show. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Harvey, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm currently back here in my dad's study. He was, a, he was an attorney now in, in, in Oklahoma City, and we have a second home in, in Oklahoma, and I'm, I'm there in his library. So you have a, a lawyer here you know, whose vibe is in this room, and you have a composer you're talking to. <laughs> well, I understand that you were initially on a career path to follow in your father's footsteps, but I read that after seeing James Taylor and Carol King in concert, you decided to pursue a music career. Is that right? That's right. That's right. I, my, my dad was a lawyer here in Oklahoma City, and I was actually state president of the Teen Democrats when I was in high school, and I thought I was headed for a you know, a path kind of falling in his footsteps. But I, after I went to Amherst College and I went to see that concert you talked about, I quit the baseball team and changed my major from poli-sci to, to, to music. So I assume you started out by wanting to be a songwriter. So how did you end up writing themes and scores for film and television? Well, I, I started out by writing songs, and uh, that's something we can talk about in a little bit, because I'm, I'm revisiting some some of that period in my life, but uh, I was um, I was writing songs, and my partner, who I was writing with, Tom Shaparo, he, he moved to Nashville and uh, became a very successful songwriter there. And about the time he moved to Nashville, and we stopped writing songs together, just out of uh, nowhere, I, I got a chance to write some music for the show. Was called Angie and uh, it had Robert Hayes and Donna Pascal, and she had just finished doing Saturday Night Fever. I had done one other project in that area. My, my sophomore year in college, I scored a, a film. I did the song score to a movie called The Only Way Home. G.D. Spradlin, very famous character actor from The Godfather Part Two, and numerous other films. He was a friend of my dad in law school, and he decided to, after he got his movie career going he he got that going and and then he decided he wanted to make a movie back here in oklahoma so i had done that one project but then it was several years later that uh, some opportunities came about where i could do underscore for television shows over at paramount and uh, i guess i i used my my film score from the only way home as a, a as a demo to kind of get me in the door there and after that it was kind of a, it was almost like the old days where you were on staff as a composer. You know, back in the 40s and 30s, even the 50s, there were staff composers, staff orchestras at every studio. In this case, I was almost my partner at that time. His, his name uh, is Howard Pearl. We almost became the staff composers over there at Paramount, and they were using us on, on many, many different shows during that period. But So I kind of fell into that. And then my songwriting partner went on to Nashville. Well, in March of 1988, you created the theme for Roseanne with that unusual bluesy combination of harmonica and sax. Can you tell us about that process? Well, let me tell you a little bit about writing that one. So we had been working with a, a dear friend. Her name was Gail Maffeo. And she had worked with me on um, a couple of different TV series. And she said, there's a, 
there's a young producer. He's coming out. He's coming out from New York. His name is Matt Williams. And I think he'd really hit off with this guy. And so we met with Matt Williams. And bear in mind, this was kind of during the disco era. And he told us what, you know, he would like to see for that show. Fortunately, he was a nice guy because we missed it 1,000%. We absolutely miss this, Harvey. We wrote kind of a dance disco piece, which is the last thing that you'd ever want for Roseanne. You know, we just missed the boat. And he said, okay, guys, I tell you what, I'll give you one more shot at it. And and then he described more, you know, he, he was looking for something much more earthy than this kind of slick disco thing that we had submitted. So I went into Sound City Studios. I didn't shave for a week. I took a beat up guitar. I took a torn up t-shirt. And we went into Sound City, and they've done documentaries about Sound City. That's uh, where Nirvana recorded. That's where Bob Dylan. I mean, this place was rocked out, man. It, it set the right tone for Roseanne. And so I went in there with my guitar with these great musicians, started strumming those chords, and Matt goes, now that's more like it. So that, that's how the Roseanne theme was born. It didn't happen immediately with success, but the second time around, we nailed it. You know, you mentioned Sound City. I think Fleetwood Mac also recorded there. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, in fact, in the documentary, they're, they're featured prominently. And my friend Paula Salvatore was the uh, uh, studio manager, and she's in there, and she even wrote the in credit. And I, I went on to work with Paula for years and years at Capitol Studios. But yeah, Fleetwood Mac was one of the groups that recorded there. Now, you also wrote the theme song for the reboot of Roseanne, but when the show changed to The Connors, the song was gone. Did that upset you? Well, they're using a version of, of our theme on that now. So it's, 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 it's on The Connors. It's a variation because they wanted to keep the same tone. But as far as I didn't continue writing the, the background music for that show, but I continued that. But, you know... That Roseanne situation was 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 a crazy one. You know, I went from working on the number one show again to to being unemployed in about two, two hours after she made some some stupid comments she shouldn't have made, and uh, that show was canceled. It it went two hours. It was all all gone. But you know, that's the way showbiz is. Does it surprise you how unforgiving this business is? I tell you what. It's unforgiving to a certain extent, but it's also the kind of thing, Harvey, that I think after a few, you know, a couple of years, people kind of tend to forget. I mean, if you look now, they're still playing Roseanne re reruns. I mean, they pulled it off. Every single thing was pulled off the air. But as far as that show goes, you know, it's back on the air as far as in, in reruns. So, yes, <laughs> it can be unforgiving, but they also can tend to change their mind, particularly if it benefits, you know, the networks that are, that are uh, playing the reruns. Now, I've been dying to ask you this, Dan. What okay. was the process of coming up with that amazing and unique theme for home improvement with all those tool sounds and Tim Allen's famous animal grunt? Oh, uh, oh. Uh. So once again, the name, the name's Gail Maffeo and Matt Williams come up, you know, frequently. My friend David McFazian and Carmen Finestra uh, joined with uh, Matt on, on Home Improvement. I went down to see Tim's stand-up routine, and it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I was invited down by Matt to see that. And so we went down to see that, and... You know, a lot of his routine, he he uh, he grunts, and and I said, you know what, that would be really unique to put that ah uh, that he keep, that he does in his show. That'd be really unique to put that in a theme song. And so you'll hear it twice. You hear it in the middle of the song. You hear it at the end. But as we found out, the show was going to be all about men and tools. I I had the chance to to work with my percussionist his name is steve reed and he was able in those days you can you could do it 
you, you can do it a lot easier now. You can actually take the sounds of tools and you can sample those so you can incorporate those into, into your music. And um, so I, I guess there are probably 50 different tool sounds. You know, there, there are circular saws on there, there are hammers, there, there are all sorts of, of, of different kind of tool sounds that, that are kind of uh, a cacophony of sound that, that's behind the musical components. So it was a matter of marrying, you know, the melodic, the rhythmic value along with, with, with these tools. And I wanted a real gutsy kind of rhythm to that. And that will also come back when I talk to you a little bit about what I've been up to lately. I went to the Indian festival here, the Native American festival, it's called Red Earth. And there are all these drum circles with these Native Americans beating on these big drums and everything. And so I wanted that kind of deep, rooted sound after i saw those guys beating on those drums i said you know that'd be an excellent thing to to put into this this musical thing so you got the drums you got the tools then you've got these great musicians you know rocking out with with the with the musical components and and uh that that was a lot of fun and the grunt and the grunt oh <laughs> You know, given the fast pace of television production, is there a lot of quick thinking on your feet in your work? Well, I, that's a good question to ask here. Let me tell you about how I, how I saved myself in my very first job. We were, we were doing the music for this show that I mentioned, Angie, Howard Pearl and I were. And it was at Paramount Studios. We were on this beautiful stage where all these great movie scores had been done. And I was up there conducting back in those days, which unfortunately, you know, we got away from. But those days you had 30 pieces in, in like situation comedies. You'd have 30 instruments sitting out there. So once again, this was also kind of during the disco age. I, I think maybe I had an affinity for the disco movement. But here, here is Gary Marshall. It likes very beautiful music to end. If you look at any of the Happy Days or Laverne Shirley, generally about 10 minutes to the ending of the show, there's this very heartfelt scene between characters. And they will be they will be having some serious conversation and the music kind of comes in. You're not even supposed to be, be aware a lot of times what we do. You've just got to support the action. So at any rate, I had written this kind of rhythmic piece to go under this very tender scene between Robert Hayes and Donna Pesca. There was a real, real intimate scene and I had this kind of thumping drum beat under it and, you know, kind of a little disco feel. And... <laughs> I look back at the booth where all the producers are, all right? I'm out there with all the musicians. You look back. I, I've never seen so many people are picking up phones and, you know, dialing things. People were very animated. I was going, either they love this thing or they don't like it a bit. So I went back in the booth and they said, Dan, much like Roseanne, you missed it, man. You know, this is, this is, this is not anywhere close to what, what we want for this particular scene. But to answer your question, you know, you have to think on your feet. And so I went back out there. I say, okay, let's just calm down because I'm thinking back in my mind. This is my first TV show. I, I'm done, you know, and unless I can do something here. So I said, ah, just calm down. Just give me a second here. So I went out. I went out in the studio. And here were <laughs> I had, I had the, all the rhythm section. I said, you know, why don't you guys go take a break? And I had the string section sitting over there, and I took the melody that had kind of been underplayed in the string section and French horns, and I played it very softly and brought it in and left out the rhythm, and I went back in. Man, it's all thumbs up. So, yeah, that's thinking on your feet. And unfortunately, I, I miss that today. Today, so much stuff is, is demoed up ahead of time that people have a chance to almost hear the entire score, you know, before they actually, you know, um, go down to their recording session. And I miss that. I miss thinking on your feet because now they can listen to it at their home. They listen to it a hundred times. Oh, change this, change that. And 
it takes away a lot of the magic. I remember hearing about Henry Mancini. He's one of the heroes of mine. And he and Blake Edwards worked on all these great movies in, in the 60s. Pink Panther was one of his most famous. And I remember Henry telling the story. He said, Blake, do you want to hear any of this before we go in, you know, with a hundred piece orchestra? And he goes, no, Henry, I just like, I like for you to surprise me. So that that's part of the element that, that has changed because now everyone can hear it ahead of time. You hear the whole, whole thing. And um, so I, a little bit of that magic is gone as far as I'm concerned. Now you've written for comedies and you've written for dramas. One of my favorites was the work you did on Paradise in the late 80s, which was a Western. Do you have a preference of what kind of show you like to write for? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that show because that, that is one of my favorite shows. I got a chance to write real Americana music. You know, I think when you go into our field, you got to be able to do it all. And I think that's one thing that was great about Laverne and Shirley in the early days. I mean, you would find Laverne and Shirley going through all these annex. One day they'd be like, you know, write something that was almost like the Pink Panther and, and that kind of vibe. Other times it was almost like you were watching cartoon music, really broad and comedic. Another time I'd have to do almost a musical theater piece, so like because the, they did a lot of musical theater things. Uh, another time they wanted all classical music. And I took the Sabre Dance by Cachatorian and did a whole take on that. So over the course, just taking that one show, I had a chance to write all sorts of different types of music. As far as what my preference is, I don't know. You picked out one of my favorites, that Paradise was with a large orchestra. I was able to write long themes that would go on for long, long periods of time. Some of those shows had like pieces of music that were five or six minutes long that ended each show. And whereas you look at Home Improvement, most of those pieces were extremely short that took us from one scene to another, took us to a commercial, back from a commercial. Whereas the show like Paradise, for an example, and many times like on the show Seventh Heaven, had a long time to express these ideas. And, and that's always, for a composer, that's always a lot of fun. Do you have any other favorite shows you've worked on? Well, I like to think there's a little something in every show that's my, that's my favorite. Uh, Seventh Heaven went on for 11 years. We, we heard that that got, was canceled, and the next thing we know, about two weeks later, we, <laughs> another station picked it up. I like Seventh Heaven because I'm a guitarist, and I also play piano. But on Seventh Heaven, each episode, I got a chance to write a different alternate tuning. And what that means is like a guitar is typically uh, tuned in one fashion, and that's the way it is on 99% of everything. But you listen to people like Joni Mitchell, for an example, she always liked to play with these, these unusual tunings. And I found that writing and tuning the guitar differently every week gave a different timbre to, to the music just by, by using, by using different tunings. So that was great because I mean we had 11 years I probably used about 40 different tunings of the guitar and I tell you I had to find a great, great guitarist to play it. His name is uh, Lawrence Juber and uh, he has uh, quite an active uh, career as a solo artist but man he and I, I, I would write it out precisely every single note but he would have to read it in these different keys and we <laughs> it was crazy. Some other great guitarists told me when Lawrence wasn't available, you know, I'm not sure I can come in and do that trick with you. So uh, it's a hard technique for a guitarist, but it, it allowed me to write a lot of different sonority. So that was, that, was a, that was a very fun show to work on. Yeah, it was a great show. Now you became friends with some of the most renowned songwriters, including Hal David and Jimmy Webb and Paul Williams. And I believe you composed a song with Paul Williams. So my question is, why didn't you do more of that over the years? Because you are a very gifted songwriter and you do like pop music. <laughs> Harvey, you've been doing you've been doing your homework, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. You've been doing your homework. OK, so 
once I got started in television, I went, you know, I was fortunate. I just went from one show to another to another. And that work is pretty much instrumental. There's very little songs that are written, although I did write a song that Kenny Rogers sang that uh, ended the show Home Improvement. And that was, that was great. I feel like that was kind of that phase of my life. It, and writing songs, you know, was not something that, that was highly important to me. But that's all turning around right now. And you're right, Paul Williams uh, and I did write a song together. What a thrill to get a chance to, to write with him. And, and uh, Jimmy Webb has become a great friend of mine. I, I wrote a song with Alan Bergman, of Alan and Marilyn Bergman. We wrote a song a couple of years ago. But to go back to what I'm talking about, back during the 20s, uh, my 20s, I, I wrote... Oh, I don't know, probably a hundred songs with Tom Shapiro. I mentioned his name. And when COVID hit, it gave me a chance to do things that I had backburnered for probably the past 30 years. And one of the projects is I have been working with Tom Shapiro, and we're taking a group of our songs that we're most happy about and I'm trying to build those into a uh, musical theater piece. And it's tentatively called Looking Into Love. And it takes place in Los Angeles, and it's two struggling songwriters that meet each other and are struggling through the days of Los Angeles of, of the 70s and 80s. And last week, we decided to demo up three of those songs put kind of a fresh take on, on them, even though the musical will be take place in the 70s or 80s, we still wanted to maybe put a fresh touch on some of the songs. And Tom got through his contacts there in Nashville, because he still lives in Nashville. He got some of the best musicians I've ever heard. And we did three of our songs, and we're about to put the vocals on him. And so I am revisiting that part of my life. And I'm pulling out these songs. My wife has, has, she said, why are you always singing, you know, other people's songs? Why don't you start singing some of your own songs? So she, uh, she got me started about a year and a half ago. I, was at, I had some people over here last night. I was singing songs for about an hour, original songs that I had written. So I'm going back to the songwriting palette again. So I, I guess I'm kind of bookending my career with this, this songwriting thing. And yes, I do love writing songs. Oh, this is really, really exciting, Dan. I mean, first of all, you are a very gifted songwriter. If anyone has not got the album Blues by Dan, which is featured on Dan's website, you've got to go to Dan's website and get it. It's really wonderful. I'm thrilled that you're going to do this show. It's an absolute winner for every baby boomer out there. And promise me now that you're going to come back on our show when this show is ready to, to be released, because I want you to come back and talk about it. Oh, I'd love, I'd love to. Now, writing the thing, getting it out, and getting it produced are two different things. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to, to be too naive, but I'm telling you, some of these songs... Tom, I, I had the great, you know, I've tried to always, you know, it's like a tennis player that wants to play with someone that's better than he is. I have tried to surround myself with the best musicians, absolutely the best musicians I could. And I think that's the entire secret of my run in, in th that business. I also was fortunate enough to write with one of the great songwriters. He, he, he is just a, a gifted person. And these songs that we wrote when, when I was in my 20s, I, now don't you think when you're in your 20s, don't you think that that is a very, very creative time? I don't know how it was in your life, but I, yeah. I look back at my life and I look at some of my friends and who wrote great songs. A lot of those songs were written when they were in their 20s, early 30s. It's a very creative time. So I think I'm, I'm going back to the well, and I'm going back to revisit some of these songs. Uh, and I was fortunate to ride with Tom Shaparo. And, and we're, 
We did three of them. We're going to do three of them in a few weeks. <laughs> so well, I think what's it. really special about this is that you wrote those songs in exactly the era that your show is going to be about. Yeah, exactly. You know, that authenticity is actually innate in the songwriting because it happened when you're doing the show about. I'm finally, Harvey, I'm going to finally get that disco out there. And it's not going to be thrown out. <laughs> I'm really Donna, excited. Donna Summer was alive and well. The Bee Gees were alive and well. And then, so when you hear the, the song we wrote, The House, and it has that disco feel, it's not going to be thrown out because that's what they were doing back in those days. Yeah, I have a good feeling about this. I think it's, I think it's your karma. And you know, Dan, when I was preparing for this interview, I got to thinking that you have a really unique place in the music industry and in our lives. You didn't write songs that are part of the Great American Songbook, but the music you wrote actually touched our lives and has stayed with us in the same way as if they'd been some of those hits coming out of the Brill Building back in the day. Don't you know what I mean? Well, I I, I appreciate you saying that because can I tell you about another project I'm doing? Yes. <laughs> I am taking my favorite songs from when I was 10 years old. And most of those songs were from the Brill Building. And I am singing those songs. So you're going to hear me singing some songs that Bobby V, a lot of people don't remember these artists, but uh, Frankie Avalon, Venus, or It's All in the Game, all these classic songs I loved. And I'm, I'm doing a lot of my friend Hal David's songs, some of the early Burt Backrack, Hal David songs were done by people like Gene Pitney and Bobby Vinton, Blue on Blue. And I laid down these wonderful, wonderful tracks with all my great musicians about 15 years ago. And they've just been sitting in the closet. And I'm pulling out all those tracks and I'm going to sing my favorite songs. And you mentioned the Brill Building and a lot of those from, were from the Brill Building. And, I, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to say that what I did was anything close to that, but I'm glad you appreciate that a lot of those shows, you know, it's part of the fabric of our growing up. And I, we still watch, sit around and uh, we were watching some of the Halloween episodes of Home Improvement that were on the air the other day because they're still playing the show. And it's fun to go back, you know, those years and, and, and see that it really is. Well, yeah, you've had the longevity. You are really a part of, you're an American classic. But I would imagine the oh. music industry has changed enormously with the advent of synthesizers and computer-generated music. Dan, do you miss the days of live scoring when you worked with some of the greatest musicians in the world? Another really great question. I I think that fortunately... A lot of my friends are still incorporating the live orchestras into their work. But so much can be done, they say, in the box. I mean, my colleagues have, a lot of them have, have built these elaborate, elaborate studios in their homes. And it's incredible some of the sounds they can get out of that. But to be honest with you, in my music, it wasn't just my vision. I had the best guitarist, the best violinist, the best pianist, the best bass player, the best drummer, the best horn section with trumpets and trombones and so forth. I, I, I miss that because I think that all of those unique talents being brought to the final product, that has a lot to do with, with uh, you know, with the fact that this music was successful and the shows were successful. I don't want to downplay what can be done, you know, synthesized, but I, I can just tell you, having those unique talents working on uh, your music, there, there's nothing that can compare with that. When you started out writing music for television and film, there were about 60 people doing what you do, because it's such an unorthodox part of the music business. But now there's probably thousands, I would imagine. Do you have any advice for young musicians who aspire to do what you do? Well, you're, you're exactly right with those numbers. And I think you've just got to have confidence in yourself 
that you can do it. And forget about the number of people that are trying to do it. Just if you have the confidence in yourself and you have the uh, abilities to be able to, you know, be a, a dramatist because that's basically what you are. You're another actor. Uh, when you're doing the score, you're trying to make something funnier. You're trying to make it scary. You're trying to make it dramatic, sad, whatever. You're, you're a dramatist. And so I think that you have to, first of all, be optimistic and feel like just have no idea of not making it. You got to be optimistic, but then you got to realize you're a dramatist. So do your work. And, you know, one thing that I was very much opposed to that started creeping in, I would say probably about 15 years ago, was, was doing like a library session where you would just be putting music into, into a scene from, from a library. Like when I sat there and I, I would watch a scene, I mean, so, sometimes I'd get so involved, I'd be crying as I'm watching the scene and trying to create that. If you just write a whole library of music and you're just trying to put it in there, sometimes it mirac miraculously works, but you know, that's not what it was about for me. And I would say, learn, learn your tools of being able to be a dramatist because that's, that's really what you are. And I actually studied a couple of, uh, years as an actor, and I think it really helped me in 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 knowing what's going on when I'm watching a, a scene. And I I would say learn it's it, as well as learning all the technology you have to learn learn today as a young person coming up. Also learn to be a dramatist. Well, that's really good advice. I, I want to take a moment and ask you about ASCAP which is the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. You've been extremely involved in that organization, which supports the careers of songwriters and composers and does a lot of advocacy on behalf of the creative community. For those who don't know much about ASCAP, why does that organization mean so much to you, Dan? Well, ASCAP has been a great partner. And I'm fortunate to be sitting next to Paul Williams as, as the writer vice chair. Uh, there's a writer vice chair and there is a publisher vice chair because the board is comprised of 12 writers and 12 publishers. ASCAP has been from an early, early on a great partner of mine. And you've got to have someone looking out for your interests because, you know, the people that, that they're playing your music. They're not necessarily wanting to pay as much as they possibly can. So it's a fine balance between, you know, negotiating with the users of the music and and ASCAP is the ultimate advocate for the creator. And I've been very fortunate to sit on this board and help make decisions that are advantageous to the creator. We go to Washington up until COVID, we went to Washington once a year. We put on a concert of music that was written, you know, by songwriters and by composers. I got a chance to do my Roseanne and, and Home Improvement theme in front of all these Congress men and women at the Library of Congress. And so we as songwriters and composers got a chance to put on a show every year. And then we would walk the halls. And you got to walk the halls because there are people on the other side. They're not wanting to pay you as much money. They're, they're walking the halls too. So ASCAP was, one. I think, one of the valuable things that we've done is, is our, our days in Washington. And we're always advocating for our rights. And it, it's imperative that a young writer or any writer needs to, to, to look to join a performing rights organization that they have a lot of respect for and confidence in. And just as before I was in the board, they were looking out for my interest. And today I, I like to think that I'm spending a good deal of my time looking out for the interests of creators. Yeah, you really pay it forward. And I would imagine that you're a strong supporter of music education in public schools. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, from the time I was a kid, things have changed. There's not as much music in, in, in schools as there used to be. And one of the other boards I sit on is the ASCAP Foundation. And their outreach to children 
across the, the country in schools and a lot of times underprivileged kids who, who don't have any opportunity, have any kind of uh, musical education. Stephen Swartz, you know, took a group of, of those students in New York out to see Wicked. And he's been a great supporter of the ASCAP Foundation. And so I, I think as much education of music that we can get back in the schools is great. And one of the things that ASCAP Foundation has been wonderful is uh, doing their part of that as well. You were very involved in the Society of Composers and Lyricists, and you developed the New York chapter and instigated the ambassador program, recognizing excellence in the field of film music. Can you tell us a bit about that program? Well, SCL, the Society of Composers and Lyricists, is, is probably the foremost group of uh, organization for composers working in the, uh, we, we call it the field of media now, because we've also got, I mean, writing music for games has become huge in the last five years. But basically, it's the, I like to think of it as the premier organization in the world for looking out for people that are writing music for television or films or games. And it's been around since the early 80s. It's not a labor union. It's a, a professional society. And we went from having very few members to now we have, we have uh, several thousand. But I would say that anyone who's interested in writing music for any of these areas should think about joining it. And one of the programs I'm, I'm most happy about is our ambassador program. We've honored people for the last, well, since I took over as president, I'm the immediate past president of the group, but we started the program about 2000, we hired people like Hal David and Burt Bacharach and uh, Earl Hagen, a great uh, composer, and the list goes on and on and on and on of distinguished people that, that we have brought into the ambassador program. But I, I think that's one of the things I'm most proud of. And the other thing I'm most proud of is now we have a vibrant chapter in New York. And there wasn't a, a chapter in New York when I started. Now there's a, they have a great community of writers there in, in uh, New York. But I mean, we, we got some people who have joined from Canada as well and all around the, all around the uh, world. It's, it's a great group of people. And we have a lot of interesting things. A lot of them are online now, so even if someone is not in one of these centers, they can be a part of these different programs that we're having. Well, Dan, you really are a legend in the music business, and it's been such a pleasure having you on our show and celebrating your career. And I can't wait for you to come back to talk about the show and the album with all the oldies. Thank you so much for coming on our show and taking the time to speak with me. Hey, it's my pleasure. One more thing I do before I hang up, because I'm sitting back here in Oklahoma. I got to say this. I have finished a symphonic piece on the Trail of Tears, and it's one of the dark spots that ever happened in this country when they removed the Native Americans from North Carolina, Tennessee. They moved them to Oklahoma, but I dropped it. 25 years ago, I picked it up during, during COVID. I have finished this symphony, and it, it's a follow-up to another symphony I did. So I'm back here pounding the pavement because I'm trying to have a, a collaboration with, with one of the tribes that were involved with the Trail of Tears when they moved. And so I, I did have to get that in because it's something I'm very passionate about, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can have that performed uh, at some point. Do you think you'll make a recording of it at some point so we can all hear it? No, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got to get it performed first and then I'll have a recording. And we can talk about that too. We'll see which one comes to fruition first. Oh, this is really <laughs> exciting. I am I get the feeling that you're at this place in your life where all of these projects that you've been kind of uh, marinating are coming to fruition now. That's it, that's it. This is the most creative time I've had in years. I'm loving it. I think you did well not to go to law school, my friend. <laughs> I don't know. You've done awful well. <laughs> yeah, I know. But now I've gone back to my passion, which is interviewing. But the world 
was given such a blessing with your talent. I'm so, so glad that I got to meet you. Every time I hear any of those themes and watching any of those shows, I'm going to think about you. And I can't wait for you to come back, Dan. Thank you so much. All right. It's my pleasure. And thanks for having me on. Our guest has been film and television composer Dan Foliart. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.